what's going on guys welcome back <coughs> to this <coughs> hello guys welcome back to this video today we're doing try hack me and we're gonna do boot to root machine so the machines today is athena and as you can see we have to provide two flags the user flag and root flag so let's get started the first thing we do all the time is the in-map scan as you can see here I disabled the ping to the machine because sometimes the machine does not respond to ping requests or sometimes there are filters or firewall filters configured to block uh, pings so here we uh, disabled the ping in the in-map scan and we use the dash a switch for detailed scan we can see we have two open ports 22 and 80 so if you go to port 80 so the page here as as you can see guys it is a simple ping tool oh no before this one so before this one one okay so this is the main page this is what you see first okay and basically guys the main page doesn't have anything it's all just readings and you go to about there is nothing in here contact the same if you try to use directory research using gobuster or directory buster you're not gonna find anything of importance so we head over to the SMB I don't know why the SMB doesn't show up in the scan here but the point of first attempt it showed up so here we have a file sharing server using SMB so we interact with the share using this command okay and obviously we can log in without a password so if you enter without a password or a blank you're gonna be able to log in as an anonymous user you see two shares public and IPC Obviously, the one we're interested in enumerating is the public share. To do that, we're gonna have to type the command one more time and we provide the share name. We provide blank password and we successfully log in to the share. So here, once we log in, the prompt changes from the machine prompt or my machine prompt into the SMB server. Because now I logged into the server, I can now interact with the SMB server. So I use ls to list the files, and we can see one text file. We retrieve the text file using the command get followed by the file name. So we display the contents of the file, and this is the note. Dear administrator, I would like to inform you that a new ping system is being developed, and I left the corresponding application in a specific path which can be accessed through the following address so that's what you see when you take this address and access it through the browser this is a simple ping tool it's a simple implementation of the ping command using the command line using uh, the uh, application so basically let's go here and interact with it so 127.001 And now it's performing the ping so for it sends four bytes or four uh, ping requests if you go back and try some command injection methods like command chaining so semicolon and ls send and the attempt is blocked attempt hacking so here the looks like the character is filtered if we try with the ampersand Two percent send again attempt hacking so there is a filter that rules out all of the prohibited characters used in command injection or even in reversals so if these characters are filtered it means even reversals cannot be used so what's a what's the solution here uh, the solution is to use command substitution I explained command substitution in previous videos guys you can get back to them specifically this video 
bypassing SQL filters using command substitution. It was a demonstration on over the wire, city of games, Natus level 16. So we are demonstrated command substitution in detail and how it works. You can get back to this video uh, if you want more explanations on this. Let's go back. All right, so we're gonna use command substitution here. As you can see what I did, I used the IP address. This is the input the application expects, the IP to ping dash c1 because dash c1 is an option we can use in the ping command. So here we send one packet and the command substitution starts. So the command substitution starts with a dollar sign and between two parentheses we provide in the command we would like to execute. Since the characters such as the ampersand, the byte and the semicolon are blocked or filtered we need to use some different kind of shell. So here we use a bind shell. The bind shell is the other way around. It's the opposite of reverse shell. In the reverse shell, we make the client or we make the machine connects back to us. In bind shell, we connect to the machine, which means the machine now will act uh, the role of a listener. So nc-lp4545, the port, and I want the machine to listen on. And once the connection is received, I will execute bin bash. So we do this. As you can see now, the it is spinning, indicating that the uh, there is a listener running now. So I go to my machine. This is the machine shell. And as you can see, guys, I connect with the machine using this command. This is how bind shell works. So instead of us being the listener as we used to do. We now connect actively to the machine with netcut. And as you can see, guys, I am able to connect and land the first foothold. So I am the WW data user, which is the Apache web server user. Scrolling down, I uploaded PSPY64 okay, to interact or to list the current processes and the cron jobs. Scrolling down, we notice a pattern with a backup script. Look at this. So there is this backup script running on a regular interval by the user 1001. So 1001, let's see if the shell is still active. I don't think so. Unless yeah, the shell is still active. So cat etc pass wd. So Athena is the user whose UID is 1001. So this means that the script scrolling up. Yeah, the script is run intervally, is being run intervally. Uh, by the user Athena on a regular basis. So curious enough, we navigate to the directory storing the script user share backup. ls-la user share backup. And here we see the backup script. Surprisingly, the current user data is the owner of the script, which means we can modify on the script. Why do we, why should, what, what's the purpose of modifying the script? Since this script is being run on a regular basis by the other Athena, and since we are still uh, owning a low privileged user, data, we would like to shift the privileged upward, meaning we want to move from data to Athena. Since the script is running as Athena, okay, here, as we discovered, it means that if we can modify the contents of the script and put a reverse shell, when the script runs again, it's going to execute the reverse shell. So let's take a look at the contents of the script and the reverse shell I selected. So cat user share back up. So 
this is the context and this is a reverse shell you can gr grab from anywhere i have the shell in my node file let's see our aim so this is it all i have to do is to put a different port port by port 7 for example and the ip address of my machine so i'm going to copy this and store it in the contents of the script what you can do guys you can remove the contents of the script and replace it with the reverse shell all right so shell as athena so here we fire up a listener on port 4547 and we make sure that the script now has the new contents stored so we wait a bit and we can see here the connection from the machine but this time we are the user Athena so the connection came and we issue sudo -l to see what are the current privileges of the user Athena so you can see Athena what can Athena do Athena can execute this command the ins mode command as root without the need for password it means Athena can say sudo this command so this command executes ins mode ins mode is a command that loads kernel modules so what it does it actually loads this module venom.ko so that's what Athena can do it can load the venom.ko module next curious enough to know what is venom ko would we download venom ko to my machine and we use ghidra to analyze the module so once we load the module into ghidra we can see first the functions and we have diamorphin initialized so diamorphin is a rootkit how do we know this is a rootkit we use google so this is the main page of diamorphin and as per the description, it is an LKM rootkit for Linux kernels. <coughs> and here are the instructions how to install it and interact with it. As you can see here, the module starts invisible. To remove you, you need to make it visible. So that's the idea of rootkits. Rootkit is a malicious or a malware okay, that hides itself from the processes or the modules. So even if you enumerate the processes or we try to find the current running modules, the diamorphin will not show up, okay? Because it is a rootkit. And rootkits use process hollowing and process injection to hide uh, from the eyes of investigators. So this command is very important because this command will reveal the module, okay? It sends dash 63 signal to the rootkit to um, show it because without this command the rootkit will not show let's go back we, you're gonna we're gonna you're gonna find out wh why this is relevant when we explain the running of this rootkit so this is the main function they are initialize so we read through the code you can see there are many system call declarations we have here a declaration to system call and we can see many <coughs> calls to these functions so we have hack get dense and we have hacked kill hacked get dense 64 obviously these are functions from here that are being called in the code so if you take a look at you can take a look at all the functions let's go to hack underscore kill this is the function that's relevant to this challenge scrolling down we can see guys there is a declaration of the variable ivar3 and there is a call to function give root obviously we want to make the rootkit call this function how do we do that we need to make sure or we need to make the variable ivar3 equals to this value in hex this value corresponds to 57 decimal so we need to send the rootkit a signal okay asking the rootkit or making the ivar3 variable equal to this value in hex or 
57 in hex. Take a look at this. If i var 3 equal to this value in hex, which corresponds to 57, sorry, 63. If you go back, as you can see, 63 is the signal we sent to the rootkit to make it visible. Read this. The module starts invisible. To remove you, you to remove, you need to make it visible. So here, it's an instruction to uninstall the rootkit from the machine. Okay. So basically, here we execute this command to make the rootkit um, visible in the running modules. Okay. And then we will be able to remove it. Right. So that's what happens here. If we send. 63 63 will be assigned to the variable ivar3 which controls which function is called if ivar3 equals to um was 63 here okay sorry 57 it will give us root if it equals this value which is um let's go back this is 63 it will as you can see here make the uh, rootkit visible Let's go back here and see what happens. So if you go to the machine one more time and say kill or ls, ls mode. Yeah, here was, okay, let's go back. So what I did first, I used ls mode to list the modules and I grip the name of the module that's loaded, okay? So here I cannot see the modules from the list. When I send the signal 63, as with the instructions, I am making the rootkit root kit visible. So executing this command will effectively make the ivar3 equals to 63, which means it's going to reveal the rootkit. Now, we, if we execute ls or list the modules, okay, we can see the modules now visible and loaded. Now, if we send 57, which corresponds to this value in hex, we will load the give root function. Let's go to give root. Apparently here, it assigns the new credentials and performs a couple modifications. So if we try it out and we use the command kill dash 570 and we type ID, we can see we are the root user. So guys, that was it. I guess it's a machine that's medium in difficulty. Just requires you a couple of research, a couple of research attempts, especially when you arrive to this stage, when you are um, interacting with the rootkit module. Okay. All right. So that was it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I will see you later.